alaikum and greetings of peace. My name is Safir Ahmed and I'm an editor at Renovatio, the journal of Zitana College. Today we will explore the topic of religions and the natural environment. Um, and for that discussion, we are fortunate to have with us Dr. Maria de Cake. Dr. De Cake teaches at religious studies at George Mason University and in Virginia. And her research and specialties include Islamic intellectual history, uh, Quranic studies, Shiite and Sufi traditions, and women's spirituality and religious experience. Um, she was also an editor of the Study Quran, a 2,000-page volume that was a massive work um, that includes a verse-by-verse -verse commentary, uh, many of which she was responsible for. Her current publication projects include a monograph on the concept of religion as a universal phenomenon in the Quran and the Islamic intellectual tradition. More relevant to our conversation today, she teaches a course at George Mason University on religions and the natural environment. Dr. Dekay, welcome, and thanks for taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Glad to be here. Um, let me begin by asking you sort of a, a personal background question, if you will. Did you grow up around nature a lot? What, what, what was your bringing? I mean, I'm trying to understand you. T you know, the fact that um, how you began studying the relationship between nature and religion, but where your interest comes from and what your background was. Sure. Well, I didn't live in a very rural environment, but I did mm -hmm. live in a suburban area that backed up to a very dense set of woods. And so most of my childhood was spent playing in those woods. Uh, going through, there was a, a river, a small creek that ran for about two miles, and we used mm -hmm. to, in the winter, it was in Connecticut, so we used to put on skates in the winter, and we'd skate for two miles up and down nice. the creek. But one of the things that I've always noticed, and I still notice about myself in mm -hmm. nature, is that it gives you a very new perspective when you are mm -hmm. in a place where there, sort of you see nature all around you. It has a calming effect, and it also helps to put the world in perspective. We tend to not notice nature very mm -hmm. much when we walk through the world. We're walking to classes or we're walking somewhere. We don't notice the trees and the birds. We're just thinking about where we're going and are we late and should we get there? <laughs> and so I think we don't always, we're not always aware of the nature around us. So when you're in a place where you're so surrounded by it that you really can't think of anything else, it puts those everyday concerns, right. I think, in a different perspective. Yeah. Did your interest as you grew up, as you went to college and beyond, begin? I mean, was that a factor? Do you think that was a factor in, in your interest in even studying religions and the natural environment? It wasn't. It wasn't my interest in, oh, was that my interest in studying religion in the natural yeah, environment? Right, no, right, right. I think my interest in, in teaching that particular course was mm -hmm. that I, I often think that religions are thought of today as closed, dogmatic systems that have no relationship to the modern world or to modern mm -hmm. ethical concerns. And I just didn't think that was true with regard to one of the biggest ethical concerns we have today, which is how, should, how human beings should deal with the natural world and taking really a responsibility and account for the amount of damage that human beings are doing to mm -hmm. the Islamic world. And I think if you take religious ethics or religious perspectives out of that discussion, I think it's hard to have an ethical discussion that's really grounded in something. I mean, even when we think today, right. let's say about human rights, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. think about it as a secular construct, but it's not really. It derives from a sense of the sacredness of humanity that comes from all of the different mm -hmm. religious traditions. So if you're going to have a comprehensive environmental ethics, you right. have to base it uh, at least to be compelling to many of the people in the world who are very religious, it has to have some basis in, a, in religious perspectives of morality. And, you know, I want to get back to that idea so, um, about the, sort of the political world and how we relate to that, with, you know, when climate change or the environmental movement and human rights and all of those issues and how that relates to it. But let me get back to the, what you said about mm. growing up as a child mm. in, in woods. There's something about in, it seems to me there's something in all of us, in human, in in our nature, that craves, mm. the, you know, nat the natural world, if you will. Um, there's a reason we like to take a walk on the beach. There's a reason we like to, you know, take a walk in the woods, as you did, you know, or um, children. If you see, notice children, they like to, you know, dig in the garden or play mm -hmm. in sand. Mm -hmm. 
right? So wh what is that? How do you understand that craving in us? Mm. One of the things that I, when, once I had children, then you notice it a little <laughs> yeah. bit more. You, you, you watch how children interact with yeah. nature, and they're fascinated right. by it. Right. And they don't always see it as something very different. I, can, I have this very clear memory of my daughter when she was about 18 months old and could just talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cat had come in and kind of knocked her ball that she was playing with out. And she sort of went up to the cat and said, you know, that was my ball. Why did you do it? As if she was talking to anybody else. And, and so she didn't see this kind of, of, of difference. Yeah. And so children are very interested in nature. They're very interested in animals. And uh, I, another sort of uh, account, I remember my, my son is a real talker. He never stops talking. And it would drive us crazy. But we took him one time blueberry picking. Mm -hmm. And he spent about four hours picking these blueberries. And we it was about two hours from home. He, we drove all the way home. He didn't say a word. Wow. And my husband said, we really need to do this you know, more often. <laughs> but it has an effect. You know, it has a kind of calming, calming effect. effect. Yeah. Um, yeah. But one of the things that fascinated me mm -hmm. watching my children interact with nature is it, it really struck me that as interested as human beings can be in the natural world, that's a natural interest I think that the children have, mm -hmm. the natural world is not very interested in us. What do you mean by that? In other words, you walk down the street, you look at a bird, the bird doesn't really care what you're doing. Ah. <laughs> um, unless it fears that you're going to hurt it in some way. It's almost as if certainly creatures, uh, animals, where you can sort of see their expressions or mm -hmm. where they're turning mm -hmm. their head and, and that kind of thing, they don't seem so interested in us. It's almost as if they, right. they, they cohabitate right. with us, but they're not so interested in what we do. Not in the same way that I think human beings have a natural interest in what animals right. are doing. So I, to me, that's always an interesting disconnect. Yeah, no, no, it's true. And I think that, uh, one of the things that, that strike me is, is um, that um, you know craving we have for nature mm. it's not ne what you're saying is not necessarily reciprocated you know um, but that there's something about that the calming effect I mean I'll give you a, an anecdote from you know, this is a personal one for me when my mother with um, you know when she was very elderly she was at the beach and she said she was very quiet for a while and I said what are you thinking and she said you know it's sitting and watching the ocean makes you feel like you're, you're almost nothing. And then she paused and she said, it feels good. You know what I mean? Like that's, it does. But that's your point about like it doesn't really, you don't really, nature doesn't care about you, that notion. But it also <laughs> has a calming effect, mm, the yeah. fact that it doesn't, that you're nothing, right? You're not so important. You're not so important. In the big picture, <laughs> you aren't. You know, yes. We think we are. Everything we do is, has, has, has some profound meaning, but mm -hmm. in that sense, it doesn't. Yes. It makes you feel very small, yes. Yeah. I want to get back to what you were saying earlier about um, so the, the, this notion of this is the personal level. We, 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 we understand this, and we know what we feel. But then when it gets to the societal level, and now we're talking about all the discussions we have about fighting climate change or, you know, um, worrying about oil spills or all the um, massive problems that we are facing today. Mm. And there's an entire environmental movement that has grown up, especially in the West over the last, you know, 40 or 50 years. Mm -hmm. Would that movement benefit from looking at the problems of this world through a religious lens, if you will? Mm -hmm. I do think it would benefit, and I think it, it, the most important benefit it would have would be in convincing people that they have a responsibility mm -hmm. to treat the environment in an ethical fashion. One of the problems with building or, or trying to think about environmental ethics within a religious perspective is, of mm -hmm. course, all of the major world religions arose at a time and were codified or had their major works written at a time when no one had any idea that human beings could do such disruptive um, damage, really, to the environment, to the natural right. order. Right. So they don't really have a natural environmental ethic to them. 
And not that there aren't resources in all of those traditions for an environmental ethic. There mm -hmm. are, but there mm -hmm. isn't an explicit environmental ethic. And so you hear, I haven't heard this very much from, uh, from, from Muslims, but I have heard that I've heard some Christians, and there's some Christians who've written books to say, well, why should we really care about the environment? You know, God made the world, and he's in the end, you know, there's going to be an apocalypse, and he's going to destroy the world, and it's not in our hands anyway. Right. And so why, why do we have a particular interest in preserving right. the world? And so I think that it's easy for people to say, why should I, even as a Muslim, mm -hmm. I haven't heard people say this, but I'm saying you could say, why should I as a Muslim think that it's wrong for me not to treat the environment in a way that tries to preserve it or conserve it? There's nothing necessarily right. uh, that points to that. But I don't think that's exactly true. I think that the, the religions themselves, and certainly um, uh, the Quran, but also the Bible, do have resources mm -hmm. in them that can be drawn upon for an environmental ethic. So people can think mm -hmm. that this, I mean, the, the, the clearest, uh, you might say, basis for such an ethic would be to say, well, this is God's handiwork. God's created this world, and mm -hmm. we shouldn't destroy it. But I don't think that in and of itself is sufficient. I think there needs to be uh, a more comprehensive look at the religious texts and the religious traditions to base that ethic that will be compelling to people. Then people will, people will treat the environment ethically if they're religious people, if they think that this is a religious obligation. Yeah, on that note though, I mean, there is these concepts in different religions, I'm sure, and, and I don't, I'm not familiar with a lot of the religions of the world, but you <clears throat> may have studied this, but the concepts of dominion, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what you were getting at, like this mm -hmm. is, you know, we have that. Or there's a concept of, um, and I think Muslims talk about a concept of stewardship. Right. Um, how do you, are there variations, are there differences in different religions about what our role, mm -hmm. in, the, in the hierarchy, if you will, of, of, of our role with nature? There are differences. And okay. actually both stewardship and dominion come out of the Christian okay. tradition. And I'm not sure that the two of them fit the Islamic tradition exactly. They have some things in common. But let me begin by saying that all of the major religions of the world are anthropocentric. Okay. In other words, their primary concern is human beings in relation to God. Right. Human morality in relation to one another, human behavior in relation, belief in relation mm -hmm. to God. Mm -hmm. That's their primary concern. The primary concern isn't about the natural world. Right. Now, with that, uh, if you look, for example, at the biblical tradition, mm -hmm. and you read the account of Genesis, uh, Genesis begins with a statement about how God created all the different parts of the world that we see on different days. Mm -hmm. And some people say that was a, the, the Bible starts that way because it's making a very clear statement against paganism that saw, let's say, a God of the sky and a God of the sea mm -hmm. and so on, saying, no, 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 God created all of these things. He's the right. creator of all right. of these things. But then something else happens when you get to the story of Adam mm -hmm. and Eve in the Quran. And of course, you have the same story in, in, in the Quran, right. but it's not told in exactly the same way. In the biblical account, when Adam and Eve fall, when they disobey God mm -hmm. and they eat from the forbidden tree, not only are they, do they become aware of their own shame, not only do they fall, so mm -hmm. to speak, but the world falls with them. It says wow. in the Bible, and the, the ground was cursed because of them. Mm. Now, in traditional... That's not present in Islam, is no, it? No, it's not. Yeah. It's not, actually. In fact, I think it's quite different. Mm -hmm. but, um, but the understanding within Christianity was that when Christ came to redeem humanity, he also redeemed the earth. The earth. Yeah. Yeah. But in that sense, the earth is completely under the dominion of human beings, in some ways subject to judgment mm -hmm. in the same way. And in the Quran, is very different. Um, the creatures, and when I, when I say creatures, I don't just mean animals. Mm -hmm. I mean the sun and the moon All and the stars things. and the trees, right. things we don't think of normally as animate in the same way or sen uh, you know, sensate in the same way. Um, but all of those creatures have a relationship with the Creator. One of the things that's really striking, mm. I think, when you read the Quran, especially if you're familiar with the biblical tradition, nature does not figure very prominently in the biblical tradition. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a story about human beings in relationship to God through history. 
And there are some places where you see nature, there's some exceptions to this, the parables of Jesus invoke nature, or the Psalms, of course, invoke nature. Mm -hmm. But those are the exceptions that prove the general rule. It's not really the concern of the Bible. Mm -hmm. But when you read the Quran, nature is invoked all throughout the Quran, from the beginning right. to the end. And it's invoked as signs of God, right. signs of God, and I, it's, of course, quite striking this word sign or ayah in in islam is used of course for verses of the quran but it also means miracle and it literally means anything that points you to god and what the point that the quran makes which is i think quite compelling is that it's not just when the natural processes of nature mm -hmm. are overthrown through some kind of miracle when jesus walks on water or right. when moses parts right. the red sea or something uh, but it's just in the regular, ordinary events that happen. The fact that the sun comes up every right. single day, right. Right. that the seasons move. And there are verses in the Quran that remind you of that. Yes. Of this, the night and the day, and, and you know that those are signs of God. Right. right. It's not even the. It's not just the exceptional. Even the regular the should regular be a yeah. cause of wonder right. and awe. Right. So I think that. So it. So it's certainly there as signs of God. But the Quran also says a number of quite extraordinary things about nature. All things praise God, but you don't understand their praise. Mm -hmm. uh, or the birds in the mountains praising God along with David or Dawood. Mm -hmm. uh, or the idea that it says that all creatures are an ummah, like you. Mm -hmm. And ummah is an interesting word because it's a word yeah. that doesn't just mean community right. or people. Um, it's very tied in the Quran to a religious community. Are all right. Creatures, their own religious communities? Do they have their own forms of worship? Um, they're recipients of revelation. The Quran says that uh, God revealed to the bi'awha, a word that is also used for revelation in its highest sense. Um, and I think one of the things that you notice in the Quran is that nature is always humble mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and always obedient. It's presented often as a foil for human beings. Right. Right. We have, well, Look at the cattle, hmm. at least they come when they're called. Right? Like, you right. Know? So right. it's making this point that although, yes, for sure, human beings have a nobility, mm. human beings have a nobility that other creatures do not. Right. But at the same time, there are particular virtues like obedience and humility that are, maybe they're not technically virtues, but in creatures who don't have the same kind of moral choice, but they always exhibit mm -hmm. those things. The stars and the trees prostrate to God, but human beings don't always prostrate when they're supposed to. The shadows always are prostrate to God, right. but you don't always. So the Quran constantly brings natural phenomena, whether creatures, animate or inanimate, mm -hmm. uh, almost as a kind of critique of human beings. You have all of this nobility, all of this knowledge that we've given you. We've set you above all right. of the other creatures. Right. Why can't you obey like they obey? Right. Uh, right. So I think that that's, but in, in terms of the question of stewardship yeah. uh, or the question of dominion, you do have this idea, of course, of tasheer in the Quran, the mm -hmm. idea that everything is uh, musakhar, you know, to human beings or for human use. I mean, to God ultimately, right. but for human use as well. Um, but the way that that idea of dominion or stewardship is laid out in Genesis, the basis for that in the biblical text, it really is like human beings have a responsibility mm -hmm. to keep things in working order. And some people say the idea of khalifa right. in Islam is a similar idea. And it's not quite, because the Quran never really suggests that human beings have a responsibility for putting things right in the environment. They have a responsibility for not messing up what God has already put right. in balance. Right? So it's, I think it, it's a matter of emphasis. But stewardship implies mm -hmm. that role of actually fixing it to some extent, protecting it fairly. Sure, protecting it. But lot, a lot of that protection requires simply restraining our own impulses. Right. And this is one of the ways that where I think religion actually is an, plays an important role. So a lot of people, when they critique the role that religion can, can play in environmental mm -hmm. life, they say, well, it's anthropocentric. It's concerned with human beings. It's not concerned with nature. Mm -hmm. But all religions restrain human behavior. 
all religions restrain human consumption. Mm -hmm. All mm -hmm. religions have dietary restrictions. Right. All religions have some forms of fasting in right. them. They require you to abstain from activity in the world. They require you to abstain in your consumption in right. some way. Or just think about, let's say, in Judaism, think about the Sabbath. Yeah. where you're not allowed to do any work, you're not allowed to use right. any electricity. Can right. you imagine what would happen in the world it's if all, about all of the world <laughs> Yeah, it's all about disciplining ourselves. It's about disciplining our consumption. Yeah. And yeah. so, uh, or within the Islamic tradition, think about the Islamic tradition of riba, or, or the, the, um, uh, the banning of riba, of mm -hmm. interest. Interest, yeah. Most people don't connect interest to the environment. They th think of it as an issue of social justice that interest-bearing relationships or right. relationships that involve the interest are exploitative. Well, let me just say, they, they think they're exploitative, right? Yeah. That rich people get yeah. richer for having right. money and poor that's people are poor for not having money. Yeah. Right, and that's of course true. Mm -hmm. But social justice issues and environmental issues are never separate. And with environmental issues, you know, th one of the things that interest allows human beings to do is to consume more than they would ordinarily be capable of. You can buy a bigger house than you would normally buy. You can buy more land than you would normally buy. You can, as a company, exploit more resources mm, than you would normally exploit yeah, because yeah. you only need to have 10% of whatever it is or 5% right. of whatever right. it is, and you don't have to have the whole thing. So it expands the power of human consumption dramatically. Right. And this is not this is this issue was never mentioned in this way, of course, in mm -hmm. traditional Islamic context. It's mm -hmm. always the social justice issue. But at the same time, those matters are not unrelated. The ability to exploit the resources, um, mm -hmm. let's say in Africa or in parts of Asia, has also been tied to injustice mm -hmm. done to the people who've lived Have there. Have Muslim theologians all along understood it, the way you're explaining it, no. this idea of interest? No, of course not. No, okay. they didn't. Yeah, that's what I mean. And hmm. and even let's say if you look at the various chronic passages that talk about mizan, which was of course mm -hmm. drawn upon greatly when Muslims are looking today are looking at environmental issues, that God has put everything in a mizan in a balance and mm -hmm. don't upset the balance, right? Right. right. Uh, La fil mizan. Don't don't upset that balance. Um, but that balance was always understood traditionally, you read commentaries on this, it was always understood to not upset the balance of justice in terms mm -hmm. of human relations. Balance is, of course, related to that principle of justice right. or, mm -hmm. you know, don't um, cheat in the market when yeah. you use the balance because right. it's also a mesem. <laughs> so it, it was always tied to that. It was never tied to the idea that somehow human beings could upset the balance of nature. But that doesn't mean that that's not a meaning that can be drawn to out cannot be drawn out today by Muslims. Mm -hmm. It could, mm -hmm. in fact, be that there are additional meanings mm -hmm. to many of these passages in the Qur'an that wouldn't have meant anything to Fakhruddin Razi, you know, or something right, like right, that, or Tabari, right. or Ghazali, right. right. because they're living at a time when there was no concept that human beings could would somehow have that kind of power would have that even. power. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but can you draw upon those things to make a critique? Why not? Mm -hmm. I mean, the Quran talks about, uh, it, it critiques people who are wasteful, yeah. it cr critiques people who are profligate, right. it critiques right. uh, upsetting the balance, it critiques corruption on the earth. Well, corruption on the earth is always understood to mean corruption in terms of uh, the principles of justice mm -hmm. in society. But there's other forms of corruption now. But you know, I'm intrigued by this idea that you mentioned that we're asked uh, the teachings in Islam and Christianity to some extent are really about that discipline and not being wasteful and consuming only what you need. Mm -hmm. um, but you also said you, that idea of stewardship or, or dominion is not to go fix the problems that are that have taken place. No, no, I don't mean not to go. I mean, certainly you do have responsibility to fix the problems, especially when they're caused <laughs> by, by <us>. human <laughs> beings. <laughs> right, that's what I was trying to get uh, at, okay. Right, no, but I'm just so saying that talk about that, that, that if, obligation yeah. of, of actually, you know, um, sort of um, mitigating the damage that's been yes. done, if you will. Yes. Um, you know, climate change is one of those things now we're dealing with, right? Or when you spill oil in the ocean, that's one of those things. So what, where, what, what are our teachings about that? Mm -hmm. That about actually, you know, sort of, is that a form of atonement for what we've done? I mean, how do, how do, we, how do we see that? I don't know if that idea of atonement um, 
resonates mm -hmm. to me personally when I think about it in the context of, okay. of Islamic teaching. Maybe other people might see it that way. I would see it in the sense that the, you know, the Quran presents the world as a living world. Mm -hmm. Even things we think of, as I said, as inanimate right. are right. living. Um, everything has a relationship with the Creator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, if that's the case, then of course we're responsible for the mm -hmm. harm that we do to creatures. Right? They're not, it's, mm -hmm. it's, this isn't, isn't just, um, the, the Quran doesn't present the natural world as just kind of like nice scenery in the background <laughs> right. for our historical <laughs> endeavors, right? It, um, it, the, those things make a claim upon us in that sense. So sort of we, we, we owe something there, in a sense. The, by virtue of our knowledge. Yeah. And I think knowledge is the, um, stewardship is, you know, it's really the knowledge. When you think about um, sort of the passage at the very beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, where it talks about Adam being taught the names yeah. of all things, all things or yeah. being, being given all the names. It really has been traditionally understood to mean that human beings have the capacity to embrace everything else in the world mm. within their knowledge. And with knowledge comes responsibility. Right. Right. Uh, and to that extent, when we know that part of this world is being seriously damaged, maybe mm. irreparably mm -hmm. uh, damaged, then we do indeed have a responsibility to act to prevent that. So for Muslims particularly, but I, people of other religions as well, Christianity and other religions as well, I mean, do you, what, what's our, how are we to take that, what the Quran says, what the Bible says, in, <clears throat> in terms of a practical day-to-day -day sort of advice about how do we approach these things? Uh, is it more just that idea of discipline, um, of, of consuming less, so you're reducing your carbon footprint, if mm -hmm, you will, those mm -hmm. notions, is that what the primary thing mm -hmm. that we should take away? And then also, does it, do we have any, uh, are we called upon to actually do something to mitigate the damage um, that, that we've done? Well, I think that you... Are we responsible for that in some ways, is what I'm saying, I guess, to do both those things? I think the essence of being a human being is to be responsible. I mean, the essence of being a human being is mm -hmm. tech Um And so I, I think, and, and that that is based upon knowledge. A person right. who does not have full mental faculties is not mukallaf, doesn't have that responsibility. Have that, right. So I think if you have knowledge, if you know the damage is being done to the creatures and the beings around you, even if they're mm -hmm. not human beings, if you know that you play a role in that directly mm -hmm. or indirectly, I think, yes, the, the smallest responsibility you need to recognize for yourself is your ability to consume less. And there are plenty of very, very practical, not theoretical, very, very mm. practical things in the Islamic tradition, and even in terms of how you use water right. when you make your wudu, mm -hmm. you make your ablution. I mean, those things are kind of built into a kind of natural ethic or natural adab uh, within Islam, even if their full implications weren't realized really mm. at that time. Of course, and, and the idea of not being profligate um, mm -hmm. or recognizing that... Um, you know, we, we, you know, Muslims living in the U.S. now will often say, well, maybe to some extent or in certain cases, interest-bearing relationships are necessary, that, yeah. you know, we can't live here without those kinds of things. But I think we have a responsibility to think about what is that actually doing? Are we buying a 4,000-square-foot house instead mm -hmm. of a 1,500-square-foot house because we're taking out alone. Mm -hmm. That we can do it, that. Exactly. Right. So, right. so I think there, you know, I mean, and this is, this comes down to each individual's conscience, I think, but certainly there is this idea that, you know, we shouldn't really be wasteful. We shouldn't be wasteful, wasteful with resources mm -hmm. and we shouldn't use interest to buy things that are so beyond right. our, our capacity or, or that expand our consuming to such a degree. I mean, I don't think you can make it into a hard and fast ethics the way you can have right. business ethics or something right. like that. Right. But I do think it's something that you can draw upon these religious principles to help people see why they need to restrain their behavior. What you are saying, in other words, to me is, is that there's all these rules that we have um, and, and, and to tame ourselves, sort of to, to discipline ourselves, not to be wasteful, mm -hmm. um, 
not to consume more than you need. But these are all, I mean, like you said, the wudu, you know, don't waste water when you mm -hmm. do wudu. Um, but you were saying that all of those things indicate to us that we have a, a larger yes. responsibility to even think about interest, for instance, or other things like that, that yes. have those consequences of wastage. Right. In other words, we, I mean, in a kind of similar thing happened, you might say, in Islamic law, is that you had Islamic law and later people kind of drew out the maqasid. They looked at Islamic law and they said, right. what are the things that are really important in Islamic right. law? Um, and I think you can do a similar kind of thing mm -hmm. um, when thinking about how do we draw an, an environmental ethics out mm -hmm. of what we already have in mm -hmm. the Islamic text. I mean, if you think about, not from the Quran, you think about things from the Hadith about in warfare, you're not allowed to cut down fruit-bearing trees or right. slaughter livestock, you're not allowed to poison wells. The, the reason for all of those things was to avoid unnecessary suffering for, from, for innocent people, right? Mm -hmm. it, the, their, mm -hmm. their primary motivation was you don't want to poison a water well right. that people right. depend on to drink or fruit-bearing trees and so on. But at the same time, the question is, is there also in that a responsibility to the water, mm -hmm, a mm -hmm. responsibility to the trees, right, uh, a recognition right. that, yes, they provide things for us, as the Quran says. They're, they're there to provide things for you as a, as a human being. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. do they have some rights in themselves? Do they have? And I think you right. can look at just the, the very fact that the Quran presents this world as a living world. Yeah, yeah. Right? Now, I mean, many... Uh, Classical commentators didn't again didn't see it that way either. They would say, "Well, these are metaphors." When it says that the right. bee receives revelation, or but it may be that yeah. may be the case. Yeah. But I think it's so consistent through the Quran. It's so consistent. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. God talks to the earth. The earth responds. Yeah. Um, the earth yeah. relates her chronicles. What does that mean? Right. I, I think that the Quran wouldn't say these things so much if it did not want human beings, if it did not want its audience to think about the world as really living yeah. and therefore have, being creatures of God like they are creatures of God, even if they have a lower standing hierarchically. This idea of, uh, of seeing it as a living thing, um, I mean, there's a hadith uh, it, uh, about plant even on the last day to plant a tree, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, right. I mean, this, is, this is a very practical thing. Right. No, exactly. That's what I mean. But that's mm -hmm. saying it's not just about you. Yes. Right? I mean, that's what I'm saying in the right. context of what we're talking I'm about. I'm never going to get to enjoy this tree. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> but I have the right to, or I have the, the duty to make yeah. it live or to do that. Yes. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. um, one last question before we wrap up. I mean, I think that um, we talked, when well, we started about, you know, uh, our personal this craving for nature and how it calms us and what the story you said about mm -hmm. your son, you know. Um, there is this idea that, you know, um, the reason, there's a forest out there that we can take a walk in, mm -hmm. you know, that calms us, you know. But there's also the forest inside us that we mm -hmm. need to also tend to and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and dwell in, you know, mm -hmm. that is. And this notion, I'm curious about what your thoughts are, is this, trying to sync our inner selves mm -hmm. with our outer selves. Mm -hmm. That with the part of what our teachings are to, are to have those in sync. Like what we do out there in the world, right. whether it's buying a house or doing anything else, mm -hmm. need to be you know, a reflection of what we are inside us, you know, that, 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 that what we create. So if you crave nature, then we should be protecting nature. That should be, the way right. that becomes in sync is to not destroy that. Right, and, and the idea that human beings the, let's say the Quranic idea that human beings are capable of comprehending everything in knowledge mm -hmm. means that it's already somehow in them. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's this you know, very clear uh, philosophical concept uh, the, of the macrocosm and the microcosm and that the human being is sort of the small world and somehow um, mm -hmm. uh, contains everything within themselves. I had an interesting um, kind of... Uh, you might say image that I, I put to this at one point. Uh, I had gone to, I don't know if you know, this was about 15 years ago, they opened the Museum of the Native American, Smithsonian Museum of Native American right, in Washington, right. D.C. When they did that, they put on a huge festival on the National Mall and they had tribes, Indian tribes come from all over and do dances and do storytelling and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and I, I took my son to it at the time. It was fascinating kind of to see like, you know, all these sort of native traditions and then all these kind of, you know, the Capitol building, <laughs> right, <laughs> Washington right, Monument. In that context, and it, was, yeah. it looked really interesting. 
but there was um, there was a, an Indian who was doing a particular dance, and he was wearing a, a kind of costume, and it had leather fringe on it, and it had feathers on it, mm -hmm. and it had fur on it, and it had all these things. And the explanation that was given was that this, you know, human beings are the only creatures that wear clothing. Right. And in the, um, you know, in the Indian tradition, all of these things that he was wearing represented the rest of the world. So the fringe represented the rain mm -hmm. that comes down from the sky, and of course the feathers and the fur represented, right. and of course there were, there were pieces of grass as well. That, and so he said, um, it's like when I'm doing this sacred dance, mm -hmm. I'm doing it on behalf of all of the other creatures. Wow. Um, and there's a sense also, I think, even in Islam, when human beings pray, you're kind of standing, right? And you're, you're witnessing. And in a sense, it's a witness to all of creation, not just necessarily mm -hmm. to other human beings. Mm -hmm. So the idea that human beings can comprehend the world, that we're interested in it, that it's beautiful for us, right? Mm -hmm. When the Quran talks mm -hmm. about all of the wonderful things that the cattle bring to you warmth right. and clothing right. and milk and food. They also bring beauty. Right? Yeah. They said it's because it's beautiful when you take them out and you bring them back. So even that notion that, that God has created nature to appeal to our natural desire for beauty mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. gives us a connection to it that's kind of different, you might say, than, than, uh, than, their, than the relationship of nature to us. And if I could yeah. just say one, sure, uh, sure. one final thing, um, there is a transformative quality that human beings have with relation to nature. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot of talk in, certainly in the sort of Christian environmental tradition about the difference between wilderness and garden, right? Um, yeah, garden yeah. is a good thing. Of course, it is in Islam too, right? Paradise right, is right. Jannah, it's, yeah, it's a right. garden, right? So a garden is, associated in people's minds with paradise, with mm -hmm. paradisal mm -hmm. state. And what is a garden? It's a natural world in which some order has been imposed. It's mm -hmm. not a wilderness. Right. A wilderness is a natural world untamed right. by humanity or human. So there is something beautiful about a garden. It's not like we, mm -hmm. we, we should just let everything overgrow, right? right? right, right. There is something about pruning, about putting things in a certain place. That application of a human sense of beauty to the natural mm -hmm. beauty is what creates, or what is what, for us, seems like paradise, which is why the Quran talks about right. the garden as paradise. But even you know, in um, in the beginning of Surah Five, um, most people don't really realize this, but it talks about the legitimacy of hunting with dogs. Mm -hmm. and Muslims consider dogs to be unclean, but the the Quran lets you hunt with dogs. Mm -hmm. But what does it tell you to do? It says you can hunt with those dogs as long as you teach them something of the knowledge that you have been taught. Mm. You have to teach them how to hunt the animal in a way that it can still be halal. That they don't right. kill it so that the, the person right. who has the dog can then kill it properly. Um, and so uh, Mullah Sadra, who's a 17th century Iranian philosopher, he says, look mm -hmm. at the transformative power of Elm. <laughs> right. He says, right. it makes even the unclean, unclean dog, dog clean. because yeah. yeah. So I think there is that sense, certainly when we, we think mm -hmm. about um, animals that are tame that become domestic animals, there, there's also something quite amazing about, let's say, a horse uh, yeah. or a camel or something like that, even a pet that you have in your house like a cat. Right. There's something about that interaction with human beings that is transformative. Right? My cat does pay attention to what I do, right. but a cat in the wilderness would not. So we have to think about human engagement with nature not always as something that's destructive or something that has to be restrained, right. but there is a positive role, almost a paradisal kind of reality that comes about when a well-intentioned human being with alm, with an appreciation for beauty, then affects the natural right. environment. No, thank you for that. That's, that's a good note to end it on. Um, I really want to thank you for this great conversation, okay. Dr. Dakeg. Um, for those of you listening and watching, thank you for joining us today. And please take a look at the other videos and podcasts that we have on the Rona Vashir website. And it's our goal to bring the voices of scholars like Dr. Dakeg um, in, in, to your attention and hope we learn something from all of that. Uh, thank you and salam alaikum. This is Safiya Ahmed. Mm -hmm.